show business is wrought with ups and downs. It's a roller coaster ride. And if you depend on the ups, the downs kill you. What is your name? Donnie. Donnie? Yes, sir. Well, how old are you? Five. Five, and you sing along with your brothers, huh? Yes, sir. So I started singing around three, but professionally at five. My brothers first got started. I was just a little teeny kid. I was watching them on the Andy Williams show. And, and I thought, oh, that looks like a lot of fun. I wanted to sing. I wanted to be part of that band. And I finally became a part of the band, but I had no idea how hard it was. You made me happy. You <laughs> we were in the studio constantly and I hated it, but I'm so grateful for all those hours that we spent in that rehearsal hall. And Andy would say, you know, we want you to play the pianos next week. And, and then he'd say, we're doing a Christmas show. We want you guys to ice skate. And never been on ice skates before, but we learned in, in two weeks, we'd learn how to ice skate. And they called it puppy love. It was exhilarating. It was, I don't, euphoric to hit the stage and all these thousands of girls are screaming your name. My guy wouldn't want that. Uh, in fact, this is a funny story. Uh, I had recorded Puppy Look. Now I, I sang it, what, three, four times in the studio and we released the record. It's being constantly played on the, rec on the radio. All these teenage girls are listening to it every second of the day. They know it like the back of their hand. I, I sang it three times. So we come on stage and the intro starts, bum, da, 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 and the screaming is like crazy. The audience goes berserk. And I forgot the words. And I'm making it all up. And nobody knew the difference. There was so many screams. Nobody knew I forgot the words. So when you say, what a strange world to be in. No, it was an exciting world. It got strange after a period of time when I wanted to change and evolve. But at the time, you guys, oh my goodness, it was exciting. Ooh, 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 I, I mean, before I joined the Awesome Brothers, Marie and I, we play together, laugh together, cry together, uh, you name it, we were just inseparable. And then when I joined the band when I was seven, it kind of separated the Donnie and Marie team. And then when she came back and started the Donnie and Marie show, it was like, perfect friends coming back together again. It was like glove in hand. It was just because we worked so hard. I mean, think about it. The amount of music we did was about an album every week. And then the comedy, and then the concert spots. And then it was nonstop work. So I would protect her, she would protect me, and we did our best. I dated her for three and a half years, secretly. I had to because I had to take care of myself. And I was giving my life to everyone my life was off the book. But now I needed to take care of myself. We got pictures and letters of Donny Osmond record burning parties. All these fans would get together with all their albums and light them on fire. I'm not making this up. It happened. And it's all because I got married. They burnt my records because I wasn't available anymore. Can you imagine what that did, not just to me, but to Debbie, my wife, that's when the decline of everything took place. The decline of, the, of Donnie and Marie, the decline of Donnie Osmond, the decline of the, the Osmond brothers. But it was the best thing for me personally, because I had started my family, I found true love, and, and it really gave me a sense of normalcy because I started to take care of myself. Because so I've seen a lot of my friends in this business, a lot of my colleagues lose it. Uh, one of the last times I talked to uh, Michael Jackson, because he and I were buddies. And he goes, yes, he did some really strange things at the end of his life, but I knew him in a whole different way because we were, we were friends at 13. The similarities between the two families are amazing. We're both the seventh child of nine children. Our mother's birthdays are on the same day. I mean, it just, it just keeps going and going and going. And Mike and I would just laugh our heads off and have the greatest time in the world. But he called me one time and, uh, it's when he was having a lot of problems. And the phone rings and I hear, Donnie. I said, hello, Donnie. I said, Mike. He said, hi, Donnie. 
I said, where are you? He said, I can't tell you. I said, Mike, come on, you're talking to me. Where are you? And he said, I'm in Phoenix, but please don't tell anybody I'm here. Because I escaped LA, I got I rented one of these big tour buses. I got my kids. I just had to get out for a few days. He said, Mike, you're a nine hour drive from my home in Utah. I want you to get in that bus. I want you to drive to my place. I want your kids to swim with my kids. I want to bring you a little normal suit to your life. And he said, I really need that right now. And he never took me up on it. That was the last time we talked. The realization of seeing my colleagues fail in a personal way, I learned a lot just by observing and watching people. When I lost my career in the 80s, I, it was horrible. I mean, I, I just don't, I can't find the words to tell you what the feeling was to be rejected after selling out stadiums and stadiums and, and all this stuff and then playing half-filled high school gymnasiums. I mean, it's just horrible. So that's what started the initial process of, of anxiety. I, I mean, I, I couldn't get arrested. It was, uh, couldn't get a record deal, nothing. A until a song by the name of Soldier of Love came along. Well, Soldier of Love hit, Sacred Emotion becomes a hit. And then I get this offer to do Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And it's just taken off like crazy. And I'm in Minneapolis. It's standing room only. You can't get a ticket to see me in Joseph because it's always sold out. You'd think that would fix anything, right? It did just the opposite. Because now I've got to be perfect because if I'm not, I'm going to lose it again. They called half hour to showtime. My hands start getting clammy. At 15 minutes of showtime, they announced I start shaking. And anyone who's had severe anxiety can relate to this. Um, and finally, about 10 minutes before the show, I'm throwing things in my dressing room. I said, get the understudy out because getting ready because I can't go on stage. My wife happened to be in Minneapolis that day. She said, do me a favor and do the audience a favor. Why don't you go out there tonight and just do an average show? Just do an average. And it gave me permission to just be myself. Best show I ever did. <laughs> and over those years, which were horrible, uh, I've learned to just forgive myself. You're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna fall. All you gotta do is pick yourself up and start again, just before COVID hit. As I was on stage, couldn't feel my legs, couldn't feel my arms, but I did the show anyway. Immediately after that show was over, uh, I go into the operating room and they fuse my back, my lower back, and put new discs in my neck. It was a scary time in my life. I thought I'd never walk again. And I can't tell you the amount of pain uh, that through physical therapy that I went through, not just to walk, but to dance full out, which I'm doing now here at Harris every night. No, I never had a traditional normal childhood. My normal, uh, you know, a lot of people wish they could have had my normal, but it's rotten with a lot of uh, potholes and, uh, and speed bumps. And if you can weather that storm with some normalcy, as much normalcy as you could possibly have, show business is a great business.